My biggest challenge as a leader in the SEAL teams is not like when the bullets are flying because that's when SEALs are the happiest. I'm saying generally, SEALs want to go out and kick doors in and get mm. after the bad guys. Mm. What they don't want to do is go live in some third world country, getting sick off the food, training some other people to do some fight someday. That's what they don't like doing. But we need them to do that job. You're not learning anything super advanced. It's all about, will you work in a team? Will you keep going that one extra step? Will you do for the people around you? Will you work for your boat crew and put their needs above yours? And can we trust you to work in, a, in an environment underwater at night? Can we trust you to work with weapons, explosives, and tactics? And if you can do that, then you're ready for us to actually teach you. It's understanding that the fact that you're going to fall short in that area, sometimes a lot, it cannot get in the way of knowing and understanding and realizing that the only way is forward. The only way is to keep driving forward. I find it interesting whenever I'm able to connect with anyone who's an ex Navy SEAL or formal Navy SEAL or retired Navy SEAL, because it's like the best of the best. So there's a drive, there's a hunger, there's a desire to be able to prove yourself and to be able to like achieve that level. Why did you put yourself through that? Why did you want to do that? What were you trying to prove? Yeah, a couple of different reasons there. Primarily, I think what initially kind of pushed me in that direction was I've always had some kind of connection to military service since I was a kid. I always looked up to, you know, and I and I always talk about how initially it was the Green Berets in Vietnam which, that I thought were just so cool going across the border into the denied areas, North Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and just doing the hardest stuff and mm -hmm. hard training and selection. And then I had an uncle who was in the Navy and he was a naval aviator and he kind of nudged me into the direction of the Navy. And I discovered that, you know, the Navy has uh, special operators too. They're called SEALs. And so within that, I realized that like, as far as I could tell from reading, they had some of the, the, the most difficult selection and assessment process in the military. And so I'm like, well, if I can make it through that, I have a lot to prove to myself as a, a, as a kid, as a young man. And so if I can make it through this training, then, then I really have something that I can, I can be uh, a proud of. And it was very, very much focused early on with just getting through the training and proving that I could do it. So you mentioned that you have something to prove. I mean, I kind of, I, I kind of led you that way, but, but why? That's, that's what I'm curious about. But why? What, what, what calls someone to be able to do that and not fear failing and not um, risk dropping out or embarrassing yourself? Because it's more than just an idea. It's a commitment to become that thing, right? Well, and it's that's an that's exactly the right word is commitment. Because when people go into this program, and it's the same thing when you look at med school or even college in general, right? So many people start. And SEAL training is the same thing. Everybody's excited about being a SEAL, being a doctor. And they, they set off, and it's good, and they're cruising, they're cruising. And all of a sudden, it starts to become difficult. It's time to really start to grind and put in the work. And then a lot of people realize that, hey, I'm in love with the idea of doing this. I'd love to just be able to say I was a SEAL and say that I do all this cool stuff. But I'm just not really, when it comes down to it, willing to actually pay the price to make it into that community. And for me, I realized... <laughs> that I, I, I wanted to do the job. I really wanted to do that kind of commando stuff, crawling around. But once I actually got there and, and I was in the training and stuff really did get hard, it, none of those reasons beforehand were really enough to keep me there. In fact, what kept me there was the people that I was surrounded with, the caliber of person that I knew that I would be working with if I made it through this, this training. And, and I felt I still had a place that I wanted to belong to. I never felt like a, a sense of belonging anywhere else, truly. And I'm like, I feel like I've found a home here. And, and that's really probably one of the main reasons why I stuck with it and why I was in the Navy for 27 years uh, is because of the people. And the job was cool and I enjoyed it. But really, it's about the, the high caliber of people that I'm able to surround, uh, I was able to surround myself with. And I'd say that's the same as I look to how I'm going to construct my tribes after military. It's the same thing 
thing. It's the caliber of people, not just their skills and not the same things that you would look at as a SEAL teammate, but kind of what do they offer? Are they humble? Do they do they lead with their heart? Are they who they say they are? Are they authentic people? And that's kind of who I kind of, um, you know, gravitate towards now. And, and so, you know, with within the training, within your SEAL team, you were able to find that, like you were able to find humble people amongst the best of the best in the elite. You were able to find people who are heart driven amongst the best of the best in the elite. Fundamentally a lot more than they would care to let on (laughs) or certainly care to advertise. But when you really come down to it, when you see a teammate struggling, when you see, you know, it's like how, like how, how, how struggling like with loss, when other teammates are, are, are lose or when somebody makes a mistake that's really not a mistake, an ethical mistake, but maybe a performance mistake. And while they're still a good person or they have issues with their, with their family members, then you really see the love that, that we have for one another uh, manifest itself in, in those situations, especially when we lose a, a, a teammate. And so a lot of times Beneath that rough exterior, beneath that kind of bravado, are people of solid character, are people who will, you know, be there no matter what. And because that's also part of the culture is that, you know, you got to do hard things, right? But you got to do it for each other. You know, and I always say the first thing that I learned, first lesson I remember learning when I showed up at at BUDS, which is basic underwater demolition SEAL training, the six month selection assessment process to be a SEAL. The first lesson I remember learning was like, hey, fellas, most of you are not going to make it through this training. Hmm. But for those of you that do, it will be because of the people to the left and right of you. You're not going to do it by yourself. When you go to the SEAL teams, you're not going to do anything of note on your own. You're not going to do great, great things on your own. It's all about the people to the left and right of you. And that's why uh, the whole team effort, like a great, incredible individual effort is required to make it through, is required to perform in some of the training environments and situations that we work in. But fundamentally, you're not doing it on your own. You have to rely on the people. And with that comes, you you know, in a funny kind of way, love and compassion, you know, maybe not the way you would typically think of it in a, in a soft, cuddly way, but it's still there. Hmm. So walk me through, you know, you, you decide you're going to apply for buds. You're going to go to this training. You're standing there the first day. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? I mean, are you, are you, are you terrified? Are you super pumped? Do you come in with a ton of confidence or do you come in going, let's see what happens? I mean, what's, what's your mindset? What, what, what were you feeling like day one? Well, Mark, if I can just back it up a little bit and say, hey, I joined the Navy with a specific pur- purpose of being a SEAL, hmm. but I was pretty weak academically, especially in math. And so not only was I weak in math, but extremely naive because when I failed to meet the minimum score to qualify for SEAL by a couple of points and the recruiter told me that I, that's no big deal, I'd get a waiver and I believed him. <laughs> and so I ended up in the Navy and they're like, no, you're not going to SEAL training mm-hmm. and you better, you better go figure something else out. And so I ended up working on a shore facility on nuclear submarines up in Connecticut for a couple of years. But the fortunate part of that was. Okay. I- okay. This is super interesting because this is what I love, right? Everybody hears a story and they think it's linear, right? It's quick. It's fast. Things work out. So you go into the Navy going like, I've got a plan. Don't worry. It'll all work out. <laughs> But then you got to put a few years of work in before you can get you can actually get to the very reason that you went into the Navy to begin with. I, I got to be honest. I always roll my eyes when somebody says everything happens for a reason. Right. But I believe that in this case, that was exactly true because or it, it benefited me because I was I was very much the young, immature, 18 year old kid that joined the Navy right out of high school. <laughs> But going and working with somebody who was a former SEAL, he basically left the SEAL teams to be closer to his family in New England and was working as a photographer up there. And But he he mentored us. It was probably about 12 of us. And he mentored us, the running, the swimming, and all that, basically just telling us all about what, a, what it would really take to make it through training. And 
So when I showed up, I was that much more prepared. But to answer your earlier question, I think the, the biggest, the, the most, the biggest challenge that I had overall, there was a, a hell of a lot of challenges, but I did have, I struggled with confidence because I always, the books I read, I had making it through SEAL training, the hell week that you famously hear about. I had it built up as this like mythical dragon that's like impossible to slay. And it was so incredibly hard. And I'm just like, well, I'm just going to keep I'm just going to keep going until I can't do it anymore. But what I found was it was never quite as hard as I had made out in my mind. It was really hard, but I never got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. Right. I worried mostly that I wasn't going to pass something. That I was going to fail out of like, you know, fail out of like the pool competency test or the, the, the life saving or the, all the, like the, the things that weed out a lot of guys performance wise, that stuff worried me. I, I was like, I don't know how to navigate in the woods and land navigation with a compass, but you, you know, they trained us, they prepared us and they were still very, very basic skills, but fundamentally it's all about SEAL training at that level, you're not learning anything super advanced. It's all about, will you work in a team? Will you, no matter what your your body is telling you, will you keep going that one extra step? Will you do for the people around you? Will you work for your boat crew and put their needs above yours? And can we trust you to work in, a, in an environment underwater at night? Can we trust you to work with weapons, explosives, and tactics? And if you can do that, then you're ready for us to actually teach you something. And so it, again, it never got quite as, as hard, right. As I thought, I mean, it was really, really hard, but not to where I was like, I can't do this anymore. It's so interesting because yeah, I mean, you're, you're touching on a few things. I think we often think I I thought, and we think that you're going to go in and you're going to come out and you're expected to show up like ready to pass, ready to succeed, ready to win. Um, and so we don't do things, right? Like myself and others, right? Like we don't do stuff because we're not good at it yet because we feel like we're supposed to show up ready. We're supposed to show up amazing. But you're perfectly describing the like, hey, what they're looking for is if you have it within as opposed to if you can achieve every single task, because naturally they're going to train you. And then once you pass, they're going to train you more and more and more and more. And there's a lifetime of training ahead of you. You don't have to show up at a hundred percent in terms of skill set because there's time to learn and time to train, but you have to show up fully committed. Am I getting that right? That's, that's mostly right. Uh, I, I would say like, there's no, there's no doubt about it. You have to be an incredible, incredible physical shape and be extremely well prepared. And you've got to have like a, 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 you know, I don't have, like, I still, I was very comfortable in the water because my mom would drop me off at like swim club every day. But technically I was not a good swimmer. Like I was not fast, but I spent so much time in the water that I was comfortable when you put my hands and my tied my arms and uh, legs behind my back. I could, I could swim like a dolphin. I could do that. Um, but I think it's amazing to me how people can pick up stuff. Like I remember uh, a guy, you know, Puerto Rican kid who had never really had never learned how to swim. He learned how to swim in boot camp and then somehow made it. Meanwhile, I already knew how to swim. And in third phase of training, I'm getting really close to failing the swim time, right? I had to have somebody uh, help guide me. So at least I, I could concentrate and not look in where I was going in the ocean swims, but look in uh, instead, just, just worried about kicking it out. So it's amazing how people, you know, how people close gaps, but fundamentally, I think that's accurate. Uh, a friend of mine, Rich Devinney has a great book called The Attributes. And he talks about, you know, when you're looking, there's certain attributes that you kind of are strong in, in certain areas when it comes to like ad- adaptability, resilience, things like that. Um, but you can develop them. And so I think if you can see where your weaknesses are and, and, and fight through that, then, or if your particular attributes just happen to align with what's going to get you through training, then I think, you, you know, you're going to be successful. But it, it also is important to note that even guys that make it through buds, 
we still flush a good amount of those people. Like they still have another six months of basic training after buds where they start to learn more about tactics. They show up at a SEAL team and even then, some of them can't think fast enough on their on their feet uh, to, to, to keep up. And we have to, you know, have them find some, something else to do. So what did you have that you, you mentioned finding a tribe, finding your people? So what did you have that other people didn't have that not only got you in to the training, that not only got you through Hell Week, that not only got you through the basic training, that not only got you onto a SEAL team, that not only kept you on the SEAL team, and all of all of that stuff. What did you have that the others didn't have? So one day early on in training, and I want to say people always ask me, like, what was the hardest part of SEAL training? And was it Hell Week? And to me, it was the first two weeks. Because the first two weeks, they're trying to just – quickly get rid of all of the people that are clearly unsuitable. They just don't know it yet. Right. <laughs> so, so basically they're not teaching you much that first like week and a half, it starts Monday morning with what they call a room inspection, which is always the worst day of any seal is, is Sunday night getting ready for your room inspections. Cause you're never going to pass. You end up, and it ends up just being a complete torture session of the, the flutter kicks, eight count bodybuilders getting wet and sandy. Well, the whole couple and, and all this stuff, and, and people are just dropping like flies. One night I come back to my room, and and I think there's probably six of us in a room, and there were like four or five guys packing their stuff up. Mm. And I'm like, well, well, where are we going? And, and they're like, well, well, this training's not for us. We're out. I'm like, oh, damn. I guess that, that just leaves me all by myself in this room. And the point there is, is that I realized at that point that eventually they're going to have to start teaching us some shit, right? They can't keep hammering us day in and day out. And so the thing that I had going for me is I think, and the thing that I was able to use, because I made a hell of a lot of mistakes as an operator, as a leader, as, as a father, as a husband, is my ability to stop and get some quiet time and reflect and, and detach a little bit emotionally. So many people that quit SEAL training, they're making that emotional decision, right? We all make emotional decisions, but their emotions are clouding their their, their ability to really think about what they want and, to re- and they're clouding their ability to make the choice that ultimately gonna be in their best interest is gonna serve them. And I think for me, my, my ability to detach and reflect and really say, okay, this sucks right now, but let's think ahead. Is this manageable? Yes, it's manageable. Are you going to be better if you keep committing to this, this thing, that, this behavior, this action that you know is going to serve me? And when the answer is yes, it reinvigorates me. It gives me the energy I need to keep grinding and keep driving forward. So I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm looking at you and I know your story and I know your everything that I can see from the outside and you look like one tough badass dude. But, um, you know, you mentioned failing as a father, as a husband, as all of these things. I mean, you you look like a leader, you look like you have it all put together. But I know that all of us are driven by fear and doubt and our and, you know, and maybe the feeling of not being good enough and something to prove and living up to things. We, We all have it in those dark, kind of quiet times. So, you know, like, who's who's the Steve that isn't the the Navy SEAL persona or the executive leader training persona or or is this is this you because because you seem like a badass dude but but you, you don't bring that to every situation every time right well I, I'm I'm a guy that has had a lot of experience at this point in my life right? And a lot of failures, but a lot of great mentors, great leaders, uh, peers, you know, people that I could look across the room and say, man, I want to be just like that guy, right? And and I feel like, and again, my ability to kind of, to just sit there and say, that's what right looks like. And ultimately, you know, I'd like to think the kind of guy I am is the, you know, two steps back, three steps forward kind of guy. And whether you're talking about business or you're talking about your relationships, sometimes you got to give yourself a break. Now, with that break comes the knowledge that you're holding yourself accountable to your choices, to your actions, to your behaviors. But it's also understanding that the fact that you're going to fall short 
in that area, sometimes a lot. It cannot get in the way of knowing and understanding and realizing that the only way is forward. The only way is to keep driving forward. And so you've got to emotionally detach yourself from whatever baggage that was put upon you, whatever baggage that was of your own design. You got to separate that. You got to extract the wisdom from that experience and you got to flush the rest away. Otherwise, you're not going to grow. You're not going to move forward. And so believe you me, there's times when I have that imposter syndrome going, right? When you're like, you're talking about stuff and you're like, I was not that person. The stuff that I'm talking about right now, that was not me today. So I have no, but I have no choice. The only answer is to go forward. I lost you. Can you hear me? Steve. You got me? Oh, you're back. Yeah, you're back. So you were saying the only answer is to go forward. Yeah. The only answer is to go forward. Like, right. Like, again, we have this baggage sometimes when we fall short and we're like, all right, I've got these skills. This is who I say I am. This is the things that I put out to the world. But then we, we make a mistake. We make a bad choice. And then we become unraveled. We become entangled with that baggage. And we're like, all right, well, and then you start thinking negatively. And, and that starts to weigh you down. And, and you've got to learn how to separate. You've got to say, all right, this is the value of that experience, of that mistake, of that success. Now we got to flush it away and we got to focus on what's in front of us. Hmm. So when you think about growing up as a kid or a, the awkward teenage years or, you know, joining the, the Navy with the sole, sole purpose of becoming a SEAL only to have to be put on standby for a bit or the training or, you know, your, your time post training in combat or what you're doing now, which season of life was in fact the hardest for you? I'd probably say my early years, mm -hmm. right? I mean, when you're like for me, I mean, I'm sure it's like most kids, right? I mean, I was no star athlete. I wasn't like this captain of the football team or anything like that. And so it was a lot of like, I just don't know my way in the world. I'm going to try this Navy SEAL thing. And man, I sure hope it works out <laughs> because I don't really know what else I'm going to do. And so there was a lot of doubt, I think. And there wasn't a lot of confidence. And I think once I actually started. Well, why not? To, why, why not? Let's get really specific if we can. Like the person that I see today, obviously you've grown, you've changed. We all develop over time. We all have maturity. We all have wisdom. But, but what led you to be that kid? Well, let, well, I'd say, I mean, it was definitely like a, 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 a high level of immaturity, a, a lack of confidence. And a lack of like emotional regulation and that emotional regulation really, you know, it, it went on to probably cause me problems throughout my life sometimes. And, and when I could realize, and I don't want to, I'm going to pivot here if I may and say that for me, one of the big aha moments in my life was realizing that, the type of person that I could be on the battlefield, like to make decisions under fire in extreme levels of stress, like I have to be that same exact person. I have to use that exact same process when I am with my family, when I am like trying to model good behavior for my kids, because for whatever reason, I could be this person. I could deal with like crazy stuff going on. But, but like the simplest stuff at home would set me off. And I don't know if it was because I spent so much energy that I just, I just let it all go when I, when I got home. But when I helped create this program for the Navy called Warrior Toughness to create tougher sailors, it was like, look, I, we've got to teach these people how to apply the same techniques in their personal life as we teach them to apply when the bullets are flying, right? When ships are crashing into one another and it's like extreme. We need to be able to use the same psychology techniques, mindfulness meditation techniques, character development. We got to be able to use that and be consistent. When I figured that out in my life and when I started being more consistent, that's really that's really when I started to be like a better person, a more productive, capable, uh, and just all around person of character when I realized that. And, and I didn't have any of that stuff as a kid. You know, um, I just, 
but for my uncle, like I, I feel like I was really starved for like the real mentoring of like, hey, don't act like that. Don't do that stupid stuff. And here's why. What, what were you doing? What were you, what kind of stupid stuff? I, I want the details, man. I'm going to keep, yeah, asking. man. Uh, I'm gonna keep was, asking. <laughs> I was, I was, I was not a respectful kid. I was, a, I, I was, a, I was a disrespectful kid. I got in trouble. You know, I was the, the kid that was constantly going around. You know, I, I never quite got ar- arrested. I always seemed to kind of slip out of that, you know, but I, I came really close. Um, I was probably not as kind to people as looking back as I should have. And I think uh, those are probably some of the things, some of the baggage that I probably would keep with me moving forward. And, you know, you have to figure out how to, how to separate that. So, yeah. So you mentioned, you know, being a father now. So, so what are you doing trying to do different as a father looking back at your past, not having your kids repeat some of the stuff you have, but then also, I mean, you have all this, you have all this training now. You, I mean, I mean, there, there's got to, you know, I'm going through this health journey myself. I'm in the middle of yeah. this health challenge that I'm doing. That's kind of crazy. And my wife has told me that um, it's changing me because I'm, I'm just bringing a little bit more aggression or black and white or do it or don't do it. You know, there's no halfway in between like to my family life and my kids. And she's not very happy with that. So as a dad yourself, who, who knows where you came from, who sees your kids, but then also has this like, this like framework and thinking like, how does that shape you as a dad? Well, I'll tell you what, I I don't know who said this, but somebody, I heard somebody say that kind of your ultimate moment as a father is when you realize that your kids are better than you, that turned out better than you. Right. And already, my 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 son my daughter are already doing so much better than i was at at their age i'd like to think that i have a small part in that obviously my wife does um i think i am definitely trying to to learn from the things but sometimes you overcompensate right sometimes like my parents were never involved in sports right so i i kind of sucked i played soccer and i wasn't very good at it but my parents were never really involved now i'm not whining about it they gave me like they bought me cleats they make sure i got to practice but like man i could have really used some like you know a kick in the butt sometimes but then i gotta be careful because then when i got my son plays hockey i I can I can overcompensate and be that that parent and so and I caught myself doing that like you're like dude you need to chill this is youth hockey take a <laughs> wrap off right and so then my daughter who's my son's 15 now my daughter who's 11 totally different animal I just like it's all I can do just to keep her playing soccer um she's not in love with it um but it's like it, she has fun enough with it. And so I'm like, whatever, I I don't say anything to her. That's going to like potentially get in the way of her not wanting to play anymore. Um, And so those are, those are kind of the things that I learned, but I try to say, I try to say, all right, these are intentional leadership principles that I can give to my kids. Like, and, and one of those things is really knowing what your strengths are. Like my son is not like, he's not the super gifted academic kid, but what I know, notice is that he's he's got a high degree of emotional intelligence he's really good with people and so i'm like telling him how he needs to kind of lean into that he needs to bring himself up in the other areas but i'm like you got to lean into that you've got to probably look at things that are going to kind of exploit those strengths i i had you and then you just your your internet just kicked off right at the very last word you back? Yeah, I hear you. There you go. You're back. Okay, cool. You, you got you got that soundbite in, so it's all perfect. It's all good. Uh, so, how was it transitioning out of the seals? Uh, I left SEAL teams proper in 2015, meaning I left Virginia Beach and moved up to Great Lakes to the Navy's boot camp. And my job there was to, to do the job we call the dive motivator, which is to basically oversee the program that onboards young men and women that want to be SEALs and rescue swimmers and divers. And so we run like the run and swim training. We give them the mentoring. 
And somewhere along that process, I got asked, not asked, but invited, ordered to help stand up this program called Warrior Toughness that we were talking about a minute ago. The thing that I, that benefited me in my transition, if at 2019, which is when I retired, if I one day woke up in Virginia Beach, where I was working my whole career pretty much, and all of a sudden said, all right, I'm not going to work today. That would have been really weird, but I already made that kind of transition out of the community and, and really had to figure out a new community, which was the regular Navy, believe it or not, uh, a Navy boot camp, learn about what it's like to actually be a senior leader in the regular Navy. And so I think that process of adapting to a new culture, because we all leave the SEAL teams, we all leave the military at some point, we need to know how to bring the things that resonate with other people and leave a lot of the stuff that would not play well in the business world, right? The, the antics and how we talk to one another and things like that. Um, so I feel like my transition was fairly smooth. Now I still, when I think is probably common with a lot of military guys when you're in special operations and you're used to jumping, diving, shooting, and constantly competing with one another in that kind of physically driven space, you know, the, you know, the talking smack to one another and just that kind of camaraderie, almost probably like being on a professional sports team when you are no longer in that, like there's definitely, I feel that void. I feel like I'm missing an element of that, like that thing that drives me to compete. So I, I, I do, I did more accurately put struggle with some of that, I think. Hmm. And I think COVID obviously didn't help, right? I mean, I, it, it, you know, I, in one, on the one hand, I could adapt to the situation because it's not like, it's kind of like being on a military deployment when everyone's locked down. You're kind of like, yeah, I can, I can deal with that. The family, we can deal with that. But I also did miss like being out, going, doing stuff with the guys and all that. So that was a void. And I think most military people suffer from that to some degree when they retire or separate. Hmm. And so you take a lot of comfort in the team, in the camaraderie, in the trust. And then you go out and realize that people don't live that same way, I guess. Right. They don't, they don't seem to count on each other quite as much as, as you would in a unit. Yeah. And I think what's key, which what I advise a lot of people to do now is to really assemble kind of your personal board of directors you know, for you, regardless of what you do, those people that serve functional and critical roles in your life, right? But you're more intentional about your relationship with those people. You're like, all right, I have this person in my life that fills this role for me, right? I'm feeling kind of lazy. I need, I need a kick in the ass. All right, I'm going to go to him. All right, you know what? I'm just feeling pretty in a, in a bad spot. I've had some setbacks. I, I'm just... I need somebody that's going to give me a little support, a little bit of coaching, right? And then I also need that person. It's like, hey, I'm having trouble with this element of marketing or this element of of my coaching or whatever that's going to be. And they're going to give me like some specific guidance that I need that's going to help me. And so I feel like it's good to identify those people and have those specific people in addition to kind of the normal friendships that you have people that are going to fill the certain roles that you need them to fill sometimes. And then of course you, you hopefully are that person for other people also. Was it, was it scary when you decided to retire? I mean, you know that the path ahead is going into business or getting a job or selling insurance or whatever it is people do when they leave, you know, that sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you see Sorry. it all the time. Where Sorry, it's I like, do have friends that sell insurance. No, no, no. It's, it sounds terrible, but like, so you, so you have, you know, it's the, like, the, the the ex-NFL player who's now selling a car, you know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. No. But 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 these these you know, I'm watching right now um a, a mini series on Netflix called Cheer, right? It's an amazing docu-series. It's all about Texas cheer competitions. But, I'm sure that's but, not crazy at all. <laughs> it's it's pretty hardcore how far hard these people work, but here's how the story ties in. Um, the best of the best of the best of competitive cheer only go to college or university and they graduate into nothing because there is no further program. There's nothing after that. Now you can take your learnings, you can take your lessons, you can take your pride, you can take your winnings, but also on top of that, the outside world doesn't really care about cheer. 
And so you can be the most famous, biggest, baddest, hardest working person only to graduate onto the real world where it's like, you know, and so you think about the biggest and the baddest and the most well-known seals or uh, rangers or, or military or what have you. And yes, you've served. Of course, that's a huge honor. That's a huge commitment. That's a huge sacrifice, but you graduate into what? And so I, I can, I can just imagine that the idea of retiring is like, now I'm stepping into this new world, this different structure, this different thing. You have a bit of a plan, but I mean, that must've been a huge transition for you. You know, when I coach kids in this, it's very fundamental. Like when you talk about like sports, right. You can use the example of cheer. It's the same thing. There's no follow on, right. Gymnastics, right. There's no, like, that's a very, that's a very low ceiling in terms of like how long you're going to be in that sport. Eventually it's going to end. And so what I always tell people when I coach kids or when I'm talking to military folks, it's like, don't wait until you're getting ready to retire to figure out that there's nothing more to you than your job. Hmm. Like there is, you've got to figure out that you're something bigger. You're something better than the sport that you play as much as being a seal, being a ranger, whatever is a lifestyle. And it's part of you, especially when you've done it for 20 plus years, like you've got to understand who are you really, right? Who are you? What do you stand for? And where are you going to go now? And so it's like critical that you write down that you really kind of ch- figure out what that personal philosophy is. And, and at a macro level, how do I plan on adding value? How do I plan on leaving my mark in the world? And, and how do I show up to the people and in the situations that matter? Figure out how you're going to do that independent of the military. And so I think for me, I, I had that benefit. Like I, I think, and it's just, just mostly because my wife was so good at like maintaining a lot of my relationships. A lot of my relationships are people that have never served. And, and I had friendships with people that had nothing to do with the military. I think your internet dropped out again. One second. I'm going to try something. Okay, cool. All right, I, I hard, hardwired in, which somehow I neglected to do this time. Oh, no worries. And hopefully, so, so you were just saying you, sorry, you had man. friends, you had friends outside of the military. That's where you were, you were kind of leaving off. Do you, do you recall? Yeah, the, I had. Kind of thought. Yeah, I think what benefited me was the fact that I had a lot of friends outside of the military with different experiences. I could talk about things. I could do things that were completely independent of the things that I did in the military. And so I think it kind of set my mindset in a different direction to think about and have conversations with people who know nothing about what I've done and, and probably don't really care. <laughs> hmm. So event, cause those are the people that's what my life's going to look like once I get out of the military. And so I always recommend to people, I'm like, yeah, figure out who you are independent of your job. And this is important too. I mean, I went and I talked to a, a organization a month or two back and they were really upsetting the apple cart internally where they were going to have people that they were going to ask to transition into jobs that were different than the ones they were hired in. And these were a lot of tech people and they were like, their whole identity was wrapped up in that specific job. And it was going to be really, really difficult for them to pivot. And so the same advice is true again, back to the, you got to be more than just the job or the task or the situation you're in right now. And the best way to think beyond that is to start building connections and relationships outside of your, your immediate sphere uh, of operations. Hmm. So what, what are you doing now and how do you see like the biggest breakthroughs for people? So what I talk about now, I go into organizations, I do, uh, you know, I do speaking, I do workshops and and, in a limited capacity, I do one-on-one coaching. And I think the biggest thing here is 
I want to help people be ready for their high stakes moments. You know, in the SEAL teams, we train the military in general, right? We train for those worst case scenarios and we gear, we use that as the benchmark. And so we're like, all right, if we can bring all our skills to bear to succeed in these high stakes moments, then everything we do every day, more routinely, uh, lower consequence, perhaps, it's all going to happen a lot more seamlessly. And so I help people say, hey, all right, well, these are the most critical points of your day, of your week, of your year, the periods in time, those high stakes moments, whether it's sales, whether it's kind of leading a team for the first time, here's what you need. Here are the mental skills. Here's the attributes, the knowledge that you need to perform in these high stakes situations. And so I really say, hey, let's let this specific moment, this period in time, this challenge that you're facing, I'm going to show you how we would, would prepare for that like, a, like a, a SEAL team would. And so we're going to say, all right, well, we're going to go through this model. Here's what you have to commit to. Here's your intent behind what you're going to do. Here's the skills that you need, the knowledge, the training. Here's what's going to happen when you're actually doing it, how to deal with, with being ag uh, agile and flexible and maintaining your awareness. And lastly, let's always make sure that we're extracting the value from our experiences and putting it into a deliberate process because we're probably going to do this thing again. So let's make sure we execute at a higher level next time. But does that framework actually work? Because um, so much of what I've heard from SEALs and people I've spoken to, yes, there's a framework. Yes, there's, there's, you know, the mission and there's the brief and then there's the, the post and you, you work through the whole objectives and the whole process. But I imagine so much of that has to also be wrapped up in culture, right? Like in the, in the, in the commitment that everyone on the team has, the culture, like if you're not believing this framework in your heart, if you're not part of the culture, part of the team that accepts it and is willing to do it, it's all just a bunch of steps in a, in a standard operating procedure or a process, right? Like how do you go the step further to make sure that what you're teaching actually, not you, but how does someone take these things that you're teaching them and not have these be these little boxes they check? Well, my biggest challenge as a leader in the SEAL teams is not like when the bullets were flying, right? It wasn't in those life or death moments. It was when, because that's when SEALs are the happiest, like why? What you, well, you I mean, bullets are flying? You're having the most fun. You're just popping like shooting stuff off, or what? Now, I, obviously, you know when things get really bad, that's a whole different story. But I'm saying generally, seals want to go out and kick doors in and get mm. after the bad guys. Mm. What they don't want to do is go live in some third world country, getting sick off the food, training some other people to do some fight someday. That's what they don't like doing. But we need them to do that job. We need, for a whole host of reasons, we need them to be that person doing that job. And so it doesn't matter within any organization, you work for the perfect company, right? You love your team, you love your boss. But if we're being totally honest, we're not going to like every decision that that leader makes. We're not going to like every direction that organization decides to take. And so fundamentally, developing the sense of purpose that drives everything, that drives that commitment, it has to be on us. It has to tie back into that personal philosophy, right? And so you have to be the type of person that's willing to put pen to paper to say, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is how I show up to the people around me. And so I, I really, as cheesy, as hokey as it sounds, I really encourage people to develop that, to write that, who they are. It's like, hey, for me, for example, like, hey, I don't crack when things get hard. I work hard to get better every day. And I do for the people to the left and right of me. And, you know, and sometimes I fall short of that, but that has to underpin my sense of purpose. If you have people that cannot connect in a sense of purpose, whether it's sometimes it's only with the people around them, they want to go to work every day because they love their team, right? They may not be enthused with the organization or vice versa, but they've got to find a way to, to connect. They've got to find a way to find purpose, even if it's for their own sense of, uh, sense of pride. Otherwise, you know, the amount that they're going to get, that they're going to give is always going to be limited. Mm. So, you know, you mentioned earlier, people always ask you about the hard things. I mean, I got to ask, this is a We Do Hard Things podcast. So yeah. what were some of the hardest and toughest things that you had to face? And I'm curious whether those were things within or like outside, um, like, like whether they were things happening from the outside, the universe, situational, whatever it is, or were they things you had to face kind of inside? Yeah, I mean... 
I, I would say the training, making it through SEAL training was, was very, very hard. I would say trying to perform at a high level and be the leader that you need to be, be disciplined, be the leader you need to be as opposed to just like checking out sometimes when you're tired, when you're fatigued, when you're out in an operation and, and you're like, I, I feel uh, I'm stressed. I'm tired. I want to just like put my head down for a minute, but I can't because if I do, then everybody else is going to think it's okay to do that too. Uh, My challenges probably came from mostly my family life was really making sure that I, I can be a better father, a better parent. And I, I think I, I fell short in a lot of those cases. And, and maybe those weren't the hardest, but I think those are probably the ones that resonate with me the most because I'm still living that. Like I'm still obviously still a father, still a parent. And I've made huge strides, but my work isn't done. Uh, and, and I keep trying to drive forward with that. And so those are, when I, when I look back, those are probably some of my biggest challenges. Hmm. Do you ever like, do you ever, do you, so you mentioned that confidence was an issue before. At what point did confidence stop being an issue for you? And, and like, and how did you learn that? How did you accept that? How did you build confidence? You know, I think it's always when you, when you try new things, your confidence is always going to kind of be tested. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of times leaders make the mistake of, you know, in organizational leaders, they make the mistake of like, all right, I'm lacking confidence, but I can't let anybody know that I don't have this exactly figured out right now. So I'm going to try to, to fake it till I make it, or I'm going to try to like pretend that I know what the answer is. And inevitably people see right through that. And so what you're much better off is saying at a certain point, like as a leader, when you're in the hot seat, like there's no two ways about it. You have to, at a certain point, be decisive and make a call, make a decision. But you also got to be like, hey, gents, I don't I don't exactly know what the right answer is right here. Can you provide me some guidance, some input? And I think that's what we're used to, like in the, in the SEAL and the special operations is we, like I, as a leader, I don't know how to use all the latest, greatest technical equipment. I mean, I went through sniper school in 1999. And so I have to have some of the junior guys like show me how to work the cameras and the different optics and things like that. I think when I started really gaining the confidence was knowing that I'm like, all right, I'm really stressed out about this piece of training, but one, but it, all these different areas in my military training, when I can start to actually go through the full cycle, the cycle is getting the information that's being put forth to me, processing that information and executing it at a high degree or a degree in which is acceptable. You're back <laughs> to a degree, which was acceptable is where you left off. <laughs> so once you go through a cycle of, or what I found to be true is once I went through a cycle of receiving information, processing that information, executing that sequence, that procedure, that technique at a high degree. Once I start doing that over and over and over again, then I become more confident that I know how to learn stuff I know how to perform it at a high level. And now when I start to actually teach it to other people, now I really start to learn it. And so I think the overall confidence knows that like, hey, I'm capable of learning things in extreme situations. When I, if I can perform something when life or death is on the line, well, I most certainly can do it in other situations as well, right? If I go step out on stage and the power cuts off or, or my slides don't come up, uh, or my internet connect connection drops, <laughs> then I know that I'm going to have to work through that, right? I'm going to have to have already mentally rehearsed what I'm going to do. And so I'm not going to be back on my heels during the headlights just because things aren't going my way right at that second. What do you tell yourself in that moment, though? 
Uh, there's a couple things, right? Uh, initially, it's self-talk. The self-talk is that centers me. And a lot of times, I've already lived this moment. So if you're talking about the fact, and because I knew it eventually this is going to happen. Eventually, I'm going to go out on stage one of these days, and, and my slides aren't going to come up. And so I rehearse, like, I, I don't need my slides for me to keep going. I'll figure it out, like, uh, when the slides come up, I'll figure out where I left off. But I, I know my speech so well that I don't require that. So, But I've already mentally rehearsed that. I've physically rehearsed that as well. So when I get into a situation like, situation like that, I typically have a performance statement, right? And, it, and if I start to get flustered, it's like, all right, take a beat. <laughs> And I'll breathe when I can, because breathing is a way to center yourself, because I can't breathe through yesterday. I can't breathe for, for tomorrow. I center myself. I give myself some fundamental talk because I've put the work in. I'm going to say, I've got this. Stop. And sometimes if you're out there, you're giving a speech to people and you forget. I'm like, all right, I'm just going to take a moment. I'm going to connect with people. Whatever my train of thought, it's going to come back to me and I'm going to be able to move out. Uh, and so I think it's real quick, center yourself. Because you've got to bring whatever your attention. Sometimes when we get stressed, we're jumping ahead to consequence. I'm going to feel stupid. I'm going to look like an idiot. My business is going to suffer. But we've got to say, all right, let's bring it back to, to the actions that serve us in this moment. And that is okay. I'm going to center myself. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to bring it back into the here and now. And also, you know, mindfulness training is a factor of that as well. Like I do mindfulness meditation that helps regulate those emotions and it helps clear out some of the distractions hmm. in those moments. Hmm. So after, you know, so you're now out in the world, you're retired. Uh, I mean, obviously not from work, but retired from the Navy. You're, yeah. you're a speaker you're you're helping people now that you're out in the real world what's the one thing that you're most grateful for where you're like i'm so glad that i have this because it appears that no one else who didn't go through my experiences seemed to have it that's a tough one honestly what uh, you initially asked what am i grateful I, i'd say I'm grateful for the fact that I, I do think I, I try. It, you can't brag about being humble, right? Because that kind of is. But no, I uh, I do think I try to bring a sense of humility to my relationships and a sense of like, hey, I'm here to offer whatever I can offer. And I'm also going to ask for help. And so I've been blessed with a lot of people. And what I've realized, which really I find heartening is – that people will go out of their way to be of value, to be of service. And you're like, you know what? All this crap we see on the news, all this toxicity and negativity, at the heart of it, when you make real connections with people, they're going to go out of your way to kind of help, help you and work with you if you ask. And I think that's always something I kind of learned in the military. You know, in a lot of cases, like – you know, the SEALs are the ones that, and, and, you know, despite what I said earlier, we can carry ourselves, especially the young guy with a sense of arrogance, but sooner or later, you have to require the support people. The, you have to ask to support people to support you with things, right? You have to go down to the engineering shop and ask somebody to help you out with like the vehicles, the Intel folks. Hey, I need it. I need some help with this. You got to humble yourself to say, Hey, and, and treat people with respect and say, hey, I, I really need your help with this so I can go do my job. So I learned how to kind of deal with people. I learned how to, and, and not and in a genuine way, you know, I learned that, hey, this person is a value. I'm not just manipulating them. These are people that like, I care about people. I care about their contributions to the team. So I'm going to treat them with dignity, with respect. And, and, and I feel like I've tried to lead with that. And in return, people have really gone out of their way to kind of help me and support me. And I think without that, again, without the people to the left and right of me, I, I wouldn't be successful right now. Here's my last question for you. What didn't I ask you that I really should have asked you? I guess, you, you know, everybody asks, seems to ask me what's, you know, what's my one piece of advice for the world, right? And I'd say, you, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have to simply respond with the thing that I just said, right? Never, the thing I always like to say is never miss an opportunity. Like we're in, in a world right now where, and this is one of the things that where I was so naive about, I didn't realize 
like the sheer marketing and self promotion that would be required for me to get exposure and be out there. But it's so important that we don't miss the opportunities to kind of celebrate the successes for those around us. And, and I try to do that. And again, sometimes I fall short, but man, that's sure is such an important aspect of life is to celebrate the work that other people do. And it's, you know, it's not always a competition. It's not, I'm not, they're not taking from me if I give them props and celebrate, you know, a, a competitor's product or, you know, offering. So do that. That was a great conversation. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, don't expect to be good at something right away. Instead, focus on your willingness to try to improve and of course the effort you put into it. Number two, when you fall short of your goals, the only answer, the only answer is to reflect on it and move forward. Number three, if you want to build confidence, you can't fake it till you make it. Let go of your ego and ask for some help. Remember, if you want to hit your goals, if you want to live your dreams and come close to the high hopes you have for yourself, you have to face the hard things. If you need more Next Level Conversations, you have got to watch the one, the only Iron Cowboy. Click on the link right over there. I'll see you there. Down to, to gratitude and the things that we get to do. I don't have to go on a 140 mile bike ride. I don't have to do Eco Challenge. I get to do those things. It changes the mindset when you're out there suffering.